All right, so picking up with DNA replication. All right, so we're going to walk through kind of the fundamental idea behind DNA replication, and then we're going to talk about how DNA replication occurs at the molecular level. All right, so we're going to become, we're gonna go from very simple to more detailed. All right, so to begin with, all right, you have two strands of DNA, and you have these nitrogen spaces that are complementary to one another on the two strands. Well, basically, either strand of DNA can serve as a template for building another strand. All right, so the basic idea is that your, your parent DNA molecule, what happens is the, the hydrogen bonds that hold together your complementary bases, the molecule DNA, they're unzipped those two strands separate and then you have new bases, new nucleotides that are laid down that are complementary to either strand. And so you get two molecules of DNA with one old and one new strand of DNA. Alright, so basically the idea here is that DNA replication is semi-conservative. Alright, so here you have your parental strand of DNA. Alright, so we have one strand in terms of going from 5' prime to 3' prime in that direction. The strand goes by prime, three prime in this direction. The two strands separate. All right, either strand can now serve as a template for the laying down of new nucleotides. And you end up with two molecules of DNA where you have one strand that's old, all right, serves as a template in one newly synthesized strand. Alright, so this is why you get the idea of it being called semi-conservative replication. Alright, so looking at DNA replication in more detail. Alright, so we're going to focus our attention mainly on DNA replication in, in bacterial cells. Um, some of the, the models um, may talk about eukaryotic cell DNA replication. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the, the process of DNA replication, the players that are involved are either the same or very, very similar molecules, all right, in terms of proteins and enzymes that are involved. All right, so the first thing we have to talk about is where exactly DNA replication begins. Well, DNA rep replication begins at what we call the origin of replication. All right, now, when you look at the origin of replication, all right, you can talk about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. All right, well, think about it. A eukaryotic chromosome is linear, right? So it would take forever for that molecule DNA to replicate if it only had one single origin of replication. Eukaryotic chromosomes have many 
origins of replications. All right, so the entire molecule of DNA of that chromosome can be replicated throughout. It expedites the process. All right, so looking at eukaryotic versus prokaryotic DNA replication. All right, so here you're looking at a bacterial chromosome. All right, so here you're looking at this double-stranded circular bacterial chromosome. All right, and this chromosome has a origin of replication. All right, so this is where DNA replication starts. All right, so what happens is, is that the oocyte, the two strands of DNA, separate. And now, either strand can serve as a template. So DNA replication occurs bi-directionally. All right, so it occurs going to the right, and occurs going to the left. All right, so it's bidirectional. Goes to the right and to the left. All right, so this will continue until the entire bacterial chromosome has been replicated. All right, and actually, what happens is you end up with two interlocked rings of double-stranded DNA. They have to be cut and re-annealed so that they're separate chromosomes. Alright, so that's what's taking place here. Alright, so at the, at, the, at the end of the process, alright, this has to, once it's done replicating, there's two double-stranded chromosomes have to be cut and re annealed so that they separate. Alright, so it's kind of like two interlocked uh, rings. Well, one of the rings has to be broken and pasted back together so that you can get two separate individual rings. Alright, so here what you're seeing is the, again, you're looking at a plasmid instead of a uh, the entire bacterial chromosome, but the idea is the same. All right, notice here that you have this opening, this bubble. All right, so this opening or bubble is referred to as a replication bubble. All right, so here's your replication bubble. All right, so the two double strands of DNA or the double strands of DNA is separated. All right, and now what you have is you have this Y-shaped structure. All right. This Y-shaped structure is what we refer to as a replication fork. All right, so the replication fork, you have a replication fork on the right, you have a replication fork on the left. All right, so DNA replication occurs going to the left and going to the, le going to the right and going to the left. All right, so it's bidirectional. All right, eukaryotic DNA replication. Again, the chromosomes are linear, but you have multiple origins of replication. As opposed to in a bacterial cell, you have a single origin of replication. DNA replication is bidirectional. All right, so you have two replication forks here, here, there, 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 and there. The two these replication forks, all right, as the new nucleotides are laid down that are complementary to the parent strand are laid down, eventually the replication forks will merge together so that you end up with two strands or two molecules of daughter DNA that have one old and one new strand. All right, so here you're looking at a bacterial or a eukaryotic chromosome. All right, so you have one, you know, one origin of replication here, one replication bubble here, another replication bubble there. All right, so eukaryotic chromosomes, in terms of DNA replication, 
They have multiple origins to replication. All right, so here you're being shown a bacterial chromosome. All right, so you have your origin of replication here. All right, so the first thing that happens to this origin of replication is that your two strands of parental DNA separate. All right, so now once they've separated, you can have your enzymes that are involved in DNA replication come in to this replication bubble and they can begin to copy the template strands of DNA. All right, so you have in a replication bubble, all right, you have a replication fork on the left and a replication fork on the right. Now eventually, all right, as the new synthesized strand of DNA is laid down, complementary to the parental strand, you end up at the very end of the chromosome, this area of termination of replication. And here, you see you have these interlocked rings of DNA, two molecules of DNA. Well, those interlocked rings have to be separated from one another. So you end up with two new molecules DNA. Now, let's zero in a little bit on what's taking place at the replication fork. All right, so this corresponds to this. This corresponds to this. All right, so you're looking at the replication bubble. All right, you're looking at the, at the left replication fork and replication fork on the right. All right, now notice that in a replication fork, all right, entire DNA molecule is being replicated, that section of it, all right, you have one template strand that is hmm, that's going to be Five prime, three prime, and that you have five prime, three prime. This and it had to be five prime, this end has to be three prime. So it's a little typo. All right, so DNA replication always takes place five prime and three prime direction. All right, so here, when you're looking at one replication fork, and we're only going to focus our attention when we're talking about DNA replication to one replication fork. All right, so for all intents and purposes, we'll focus on on this side here, all right? So notice that you have an a replication bubble, all right? So this is your five prime end on top template strand on bottom, all right? So this is the template and then down here, you have your other template strand of parental DNA, all right? So right now, these two strands have yet to open up, all right? But here, replication bubble, your two parental strands have opened up, okay? So, one strand has a free five prime end, the other has the free three prime end. 
All right, so DNA replication always occurs five prime to three prime. All right, so what you end up with is a leading and a lagging strand of DNA, all right, in terms of a newly synthesized strand of DNA. One's called the leading strand, one called, one's called the lagging strand. All right, the leading strand is synthesized in the direction that the replication fork is opening up. All right, so in this case, this replication fork on this side is opening left to right, all right? And since this template strand has a five prime end on the right side, the complementary strand is going to be going left to right. All right, so remember that molecule DNA the strands are anti-parallel, right? So the strand of DNA would have to be five prime and three prime in terms of a newly synthesized strand, all right, for this template. Now, that does pose quite of a problem though, all right, because here you have on this parental strand, you have a free three prime end. Well, again, DNA replication only occurs five prime and three prime. So basically, as this replication bubble opens up, you have DNA that is laid down as a newly synthesized strand that's going in the opposite direction that that fork is opening up. All right, because if this ends the three prime end, that would make the complementary strand five prime. Well, here's the problem though. All right, going back to this idea of a free three prime hydroxyl needing to be laid down for further nucleotides to be attached. Well, this is a problem because you're going to run into an issue of there not being anything present here. Because as this opens up, all right, you don't have any pre-existing three prime hydroxyl. All right, so you end up with segments of newly synthesized DNA being produced on the lagging side of the replication fork. All right, now the important thing to notice here is that what's taking place on this side is taking place on this side, but it's in the, it's oriented in the opposite direction. It's inverted. All right. So this strand on the bottom, the newly synthesized strand, it's going to be the leading strand, and the one up top is the lagging. All right, so this is kind of showing you in comparing the origin of replication and DNA synthesis bacterial chromosome compared to eukaryotic chromosome. All right, so again, in both, DNA replication is bidirectional. All right, bacterial chromosomes, one origin of replication, eukaryotic chromosomes, multiple origins of replication. All right, right now, this is only showing you here and here the leading strand. All right, here and here, these should be, once these strands of daughter DNA are laid down, all right, these would be the lagging strands. Okay. But what they're showing you in the picture is just the, the leading strands.
All right, so there are different proteins and enzymes. All right, they're involved in DNA replication. All right, so this table summarizes the function of each of these particular proteins and enzymes. All right, so it's important that you recognize the function of each of these guys and know what they do. All right, so as I'm going over the process of DNA replication, all right, I'll talk about DNA replication involving the, the leading strand and DNA replication involving the lagging strand. And then we'll look at it as one big picture. All right, so we, we, we're gonna separate it out into different parts. All right, so here, this is showing you a replication fork. All right, so this is only showing you the replication fork on the left side of the replication bubble. All right, so you have a couple of things going on here. All right, so one of the first things that happens is that your replication fork has to has to open up, right? All right, so you're your parental strands of DNA have to be separated from one another. All right, well, that's the job of this guy right here. All right, so DNA helicase unzips and breaks the hydrogen bonds that hold together your complementary base pairs between your parental strands of DNA. All right, now, what is keeping these two parental strands of DNA from reannealing? And coming back together all right well that's the job of these guys here all right so your single stranded DNA binding proteins all right well think about it these two strands of parental DNA separate all right so this portion of the DNA molecule for this period of time is temporarily single stranded all right so you have single stranded binding proteins that attach that prevent it from reannealing all right, it keeps the replication bubble open. Now, you have another player that's called primase. All right, primase comes in and lays down a RNA primer. Okay, so earlier I was talking about how you have to have a pre-existing Three prime, three prime hydroxyl uh, in, order, in order for um, nucleotides, DNA nucleotides, to be be attached. Well, in this case, what happens is you have a RNA primer that's laid down. So basically you have a, a sequence of complementary RNA nucleotides that get laid down that serve as a, a point of attachment all right for DNA nucleotides all right because these DNA nucleotides that are coming in can be attached to this three prime hydroxyl on your RNA primer all right so that's kind of needed to get the ball rolling all right and this happens on both the leading strand and the lagging strand all right and then notice your replication fork 
is going to open right to left. All right. So as it opens up, all right, one thing you're not shown is the DNA molecule on this side. All right. All right, so you're only being shown a segment of it. But the idea here is that as the DNA is being is being opened up, the other end of the DNA molecule is act actually undergoing stripper coiling and it's actually tightening up and wrapping around itself. And so you have these enzymes called topoisomerases that come in and basically remove the supercoiling to kind of relax the DNA. All right, its job is to remove the tangles as DNA replication is taking place. All right, it's, it's ensuring that as its replication fork is opening up, as the replication bubble is getting larger, that it's going to be able to open up. All right, because if you end up with somewhere along the line, you have some type of kink in the DNA, and that replication fork can't open, well, at that point in time, that replication fork is stalled. All right, which can be very problematic. All right, so this image, all right, which we'll come back to a little bit later on. All right, it's kind of a big overview. All right, but basically, it's basically taking this picture here and taking it a step further. All right, so now we're actually adding in our leading and our lagging strand. All right, now we're gonna talk about what's going on on the leading strand, and we're gonna talk about what's going on on the lagging strand. All right, now, your leading strand of newly synthesized DNA is going to be synthesized continuously, all right? Your lagging strand is going to be synthesized dis discontinuously, all right? So what that means is that basically primase comes in, it's gonna lay down its RNA primer, and then you'll have your newly synthesized strand of your living strand of DNA that's synthesized continuously, all right? And this strand is going to be synthesized in the direction that the replication fork is opening up. All right, so this replication bubbles on this side is opening up right to left. All right, so this is your leading strand up top. And it's only going to need one RNA primer. All right, now your lagging strand, on the other hand, all right, it has to wait for there to be a free three prime hydroxyl to begin laying down DNA nucleotides. Well, that's a problem, all right, because a portion of the template is actually obscured because it has to wait for that replication fork to open. All right, so what you end up with are many, many RNA primers that get laid down. And those serve as basically the starting point for many segments of the lagging strand to be synthesized. All right, so this is why your lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously. It's synthesized in fragments. All right, in fact, these fragments are what we refer to as Okazaki. All 
fragments. All right, so why is it that the the lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously and the leading strand is synthesized continuously? Well, it has to do with the enzyme involved in the polymerization of DNA nucleotides of attaching DNA nucleotides to that pre-existing RNA primer and subsequent DNA nucleotides. All right, so DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to the existing three prime hydroxyl end. All right, so this is why you need a short RNA primer. Right, that kind of serves as a, a temporary template to allow for the beginning of DNA polymerization. All right, so the function of DNA polymerase is to elongate the newly synthesized strand of DNA. All right, so DNA polymerase requires two things. It requires a RNA primer and a template strand. All right, so here you're being shown all right, your template strand and your newly synthesized strand of DNA. All right, so here you have your free 3 prime hydroxyl and your pre-existing newly synthesized strand. All right, and here you have the addition of a nucleotide, a new nucleotide. All right, so you have this process of breaking off these two phosphates from this nucleotide triphosphate molecule, and you have the attachment of the phosphate to the third carbon atom of this DNA molecule. All right, so the third, third carbon atom of the deoxyribose sugar. All right, so this is where you have the formation of your phosphodiester bond is here. All right, and this enzyme, DNA polymerase, can only elongate DNA in the five prime to three prime direction. All right, so again here, you have your parental template, DNA on the right, and you have your daughter strand of newly synthesized DNA on the left. All right, you have a free three prime end. All right, you have your synthesis reaction, so the formation of your phosphodiester bond. All right, here you have the formation of this covalent link between the pre existing daughter strand and your new nucleotide that's complementary to the parental strand. All right, so this anti-parallel structure of DNA, All right. you can only add new nucleotides to a pre-existing free three prime hydroxyl. All right, so the anti-parallel nature of the DNA molecule itself is what's leading to 
a leading and a lagging strand of newly synthesized DNA. <clears throat> all right, so again, to reiterate, all right, DNA replication is bidirectional. All right, so so far, all right, we've only talked about one replication fork. All right, so far we've focused our attention to the the left side of the replication bubble. All right, but it's important to remember that what's occurring on the left side of the replication bubble is occurring on the right side, but it's inverted. All right, your your leading strand on one side will be your lagging strand on the other. And your lagging strand on one side will be the leading strand on the other. All right, so they're inverted. All right. All right, so we're going to focus our attention on just one side as we explain the synthesis of the leading strand and the synthesis of the lagging strand. All right, so your leading strand gets synthesized continuously. All right, so the direction that the replication fork is opening up. All right, your lagging strand is going to be synthesized in the opposite direction that the replication fork is opening. All right, so your lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously. All right, so you end up with these segments of RNA primers and DNA nucleotides, but they're in fragments. All right, so you only have sections of it that have been assembled. All right, so it's not a complete full strand of DNA, right? <clears throat> 
So what do you have to do? You have to connect those things. All right, so those fragments are what we call Okazaki fragments. And so the fragments actually have to be glued together. All right, so they get ligated. All right, so you have an enzyme called DNA ligase that ligases or glues your DNA fragments, your Okazaki fragments together. All right, so we're going to first talk about the synthesis of the leading strand, all right? Because it's, in all honesty, it's the it's simplest to kind of grasp what's taking place. All right, so first, you have DNA helicase that comes in and unzips the double-stranded DNA molecule into two parental template strands. All right, so now your molecule DNA, you have your open replication bubble that's formed. All right, so next you have single-stranded binding proteins that come in and stabilize the single-stranded section of the replication bubble. All right, this is to prevent those two single-stranded molecules of DNA from re-annealing with one another, okay? Next, now think about it. This DNA helicase enzyme is coming in and it's opening up the replication fork. It's unzipping the DNA. Well, think about it. If you've ever intertwined two pieces of rope and then you grasped both ends of the rope and you try to pull them apart, all right, you eventually end up with a knot, right? There's resistance, it kind of kinks up on itself. All right, so that's what's taking place here, is you have these kinks that form where the DNA gets all knotted up on itself. All right, so you have an enzyme called topoisomerase that goes in and it relieves these coils in the DNA ahead all right, so ahead of the replication fork. All right, so it's relieving any torsional stress in the molecule of the DNA. Ahead of the replication fork. Next, you have your primase. It comes in and lays down an RNA primer. All right, so look at this molecule of DNA. Up top, you're going five prime to three prime in this direction. On the bottom, you're going five prime to three prime in this direction. All right, so right now we're only going to focus our attention 
on the top strand. All right, so here, notice your RNA primer is laying down, is being laid down in the five prime direction here. All right, so it's anti-parallel to the parental strand up top. All right, so you have your laying down of your RNA primer that serves as a kind of a starting point for your DNA nucleotides to be laid down. All right, because again, DNA polymerase can only attach DNA nucleotides to a pre-existing three prime hydroxyl. All right, so that's the function of this primase. All right, so to kind of blow up what's taking place on your, your leading strand. All right, so again, your, your helicase enzyme is continue, continuing to unwind the DNA. All right, your, your topo isomerase enzyme is relieving any torsional stress in the DNA. You have more single-stranded binding proteins that are laid down. All right, and um, here, look at the RNA primer. All right, so the RNA primer is complementary to the parental template up top, all right, in gray. All right, so this is going five prime, three prime in this direction, all right, so the other end of the newly synthesized molecule strand of DNA has to go in the opposite direction, all right, because it's anti-parallel. All right, so your RNA primer is being laid down, five prime end here, all right, so it's anti-parallel to the parental strand. And your, your bases are complementary, but notice here that you have guanine complementary to cytosine, but adenine is complementary to uracil. All right, so remember that this is a RNA primer. RNA has uracil in place of thymine. All right, so now I attach to this, you have this pre-existing three prime hydroxyl. All right, so now DNA polymerase could come in and attach DNA nucleotides so that you have nucleotides that get laid down that will be complementary all right, to the parental strand of DNA. All right, so DNA polymerase. All right, this enzyme can only add DNA nucleotides in the five prime to three prime direction. All right, and so since the strand of DNA is being synthesized left to right, right, because the replication fork is opening to the right. All right, now the leading strand is being synthesized left to right. The op replication fork is being opened on the right side. So this is your leading strand. So it's synthesized continuously, all right? So it doesn't stop, all right? And unless there's some, some problem, all right? It's gonna continue to be synthesized. All right? The sliding clamp, the function of the sliding clamp is basically to keep DNA polymerase attached to the parental strand of DNA. Okay, that's its job. It's like a donut. All right, it kind of wraps around the the parental DNA and kind of holds the DNA polymerase enzyme in place until it reaches the very end of the molecule of DNA and falls off or it reaches the end of replication bubble and falls off. 
right, so here. Looking at the synthesis of the lagging strand. All right, so for all intents and purposes, all right, we're going to only look at the bottom strand here. All right, so the bottom strand is what we're going to focus on. All right, so. The bottom strand of the parental DNA is oriented in the five prime and three prime direction going left to right. All right, so again, the replication fork is opening left to right. All right, so that means that this bottom strand of parental DNA, as its complementary newly synthesized strand, is being assembled, it actually has to wait for the replication fork to open up. All right, for the enzymes involved in synthesizing new DNA nucleotides to be able to do their job. All right, so it's having to kind of wait and catch up. All right, for this replication fork to open and expose those bases on the parental strand of DNA. All right, because the newly synthesized strand of DNA on the lagging strand, in this case, is being synthesized right to left. All right, it's being synthesized in the five prime or three prime direction, but in this case, it's being synthesized right to left. All right, so here you have your RNA primer. All right, it gets laid down. All right, again, you have the five prime end on the right side of the primer. And then on the left side of the primer here, you have a free three prime hydroxyl. All right, so it's basically a template for DNA polymerase to come in and add on DNA nucleotides. All right, so DNA polymerase comes in, it lays down DNA nucleotides in the five prime, three prime direction. All right, but notice that there's a section of the parental template strand that's actually obscured by these single-stranded binding proteins. All right, so you have to wait for another RNA primer to be laid down for those for that section of the template strand to be used as a template. All right, so here, you're being shown that displacement. All right, so you have your first Okazaki fragment that was being assembled. And now you have the second Okazaki fragment that's assembled. And basically, DNA polymerase is going to continue to synthesize, all right, this strand of new DNA until it bumps into the RNA primer. And when it bumps into the RNA primer, that RNA, that DNA polymerase enzyme falls off. All right, the clamp will loosen and DNA polymerase will fall off of the molecule of DNA. All right, now, all right, so so far we've only talked about DNA polymerase three. All right, so DNA polymerase three is the one that's doing the job of laying down these DNA nucleotides. All right, but now, what about the RNA primers? Well, the RNA primers have to be replaced with 
DNA nucleotides. All right, and that's the job of DNA polymerase one. DNA polymerase one comes in and replaces the RNA nucleotides with the RNA primer with DNA nucleotides. Now again, DNA polymerase can only replicate the DNA in the five prime to the three prime direction. Next, you have a, another enzyme that comes in. And its job is to basically glue together these fragments. All right, so what happens is, as these DNA nucleotide, these RNA nucleotides are removed by DNA polymerase one, you're always gonna end up with a gap. where you have a free three prime hydroxyl and you have a free five prime phosphate. And DNA ligase, its job is to glue together two Okazaki fragments. So it's one continuous strand of newly synthesized DNA. All right, so that's what's taking place here. DNA ligase, all right, it comes in and you have your pre-existing three prime hydroxyl. All right, so you have your pre-existing three prime hydroxyl here, all right? And you have your your five prime phosphate here, all right. So these are two Okazaki fragments that have to be glued together. And so DNA ligase comes in and basically forms the covalent bond between these two sections. All right, it forms a phosphodiester bond between one Okazaki fragment and another. All right, so here, coming back to the image we looked at before, all right, you're being shown all the players that are involved in synthesizing the leading and lagging strand of the daughter DNA. All right, so it's important that you know the leading strand size continuously. It's going in the direction that the replication fork is opening. The lagging strand is sized discontinuously in Okazaki fragments. And those fragments are being sized in the direction opposite that the replication fork is opening. And that those fragments have to be glued together and assembled so that you have one continuous strand. So that it becomes continuous.
All right, so it's important that you understand that the leading and the lagging strand, all right, yes, the leading strand is going to be subsized continuously, the lagging strand subsides discontinuously, but that both these strands are being synthesized at the same time. All right, so it's a highly complex process. Okay, so match the function of each of these enzymes that are involved in DNA replication with the term. Alright, so <clears throat> looking at DNA polymerase 1, what's this job? Is it to unzip the DNA? Is it to synthesize an RNA primer? Adding bases to the DNA chain, proofreading, removing RNA primer, closing gaps, repairing mismatches, 
vinyl binding of nicks and DNA, DNA synthesis and repair, supercoiling, untangling. All right, well, DNA polymer is one. All right, this is involved in removing the primer, the RNA primer, for closing those gaps, aids in closing gaps, and also has a proofreading ability so it can repair mistakes. All right, so it, this is D. DNA polymerase three. Its job, in this case, is to add bases to the DNA chain and also has a proofreading ability. All right, so answer that C. All right. DNA helicase, its job is to unzip the double-stranded DNA helix. So you have two strands of single-stranded DNA. Ligase. Ligase is involved in the final binding of NICs and DNA during its synthesis. Primase, it synthesizes an RNA primer. All right, and then the supercoiling and untangling of DNA, that's the job of your topo isomerases.